Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Writers and Books Visiting Author Series. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the Director of Adult Programs. Mm -hmm. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages and backgrounds, all currently available online. Our theme for 2021 is Taking Care. We're celebrating all the ways we can take care of ourselves and take care of others this year. You can check out our full upcoming schedule at wab.org. We're so excited to have two poets with us tonight. First, we'll hear uh, each of them read, and then we'll have a conversation with them about their work. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free to submit questions to the Q&A function. Both their books are available through the, our bookstore, Ampersand Books, and I'll put the link in the chat. First, we have Alicia Hoffman reading. Originally from Pennsylvania, Pushcart Prize nominated poet, Alicia Hoffman lives, writes, and teaches in Rochester, New York. She is the author of the full-length collections, Railroad Phoenix and Like Stardust in the Peat Moss. Her new book, Animal, is available from Future Cycle Press. Alicia, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Dan, um, for having me. And um, David, uh, I'm really excited to share some of these poems with everybody. Um, so I'm going to be reading tonight, um, I, think, I think around five poems um, from my book, Animal. And then I'm going to end with two poems um, that are newer, that are maybe making their way into another manuscript. So. I am going to start my time because um, I definitely don't want to go over. So this book has kind of as its um, spine um, the, the death of my Australian cattle dog, Jinxie. Um, not all the poems are about that moment, um, but they did really kind of make the glue of the book. So I'm probably going to read some of those and then end with some from the third section. So the first poem I'm gonna read is called Animal Loss. I bet we've all seen flags fly half mast. Silent September subways, the balancing act of going on despite of what has left us. The ultimate paradox, loss brings scrub jays to sing an obituary in choral tenor. So stop your foraging. Let me tell you about Eleanor, matriarch of an elephant herd who broke open a stampede of mourning, or Hachiko and Capitan, two dogs greeting each day for the ghost of an owner no longer able to meet them in body haunting the halls where small gods hang their heads, where each wager is a howling moon, a parched throat, a saltwater rain. It's an animal loss, betting against odds like these. Today, the Cascadia subduction zone may cause a chain of tectonic shifts rearranging the Pacific Northwest. Today, the chance that shooters converge in Chattanooga, Corpus Christi, Fort Drum doubles. Today, my cattle dog trembles from arthritis. Breathless from a liver enzyme spiraling out of control, I cannot reconcile her growing old with leaving. Meanwhile, the insurance men, that squad of nothing, pull folding chairs to the table. Shuffle another deck, the scrawny one says, as coins begin to pile. One price for natural cause, another for mass disaster. I go to the table. I bet I will not live forever. I bet I've the heart of an innocent pup. I bet I do not know who will wait for me on the train platform when my time is up and I fold. Um, this next one I'm going to read is called Holy Day. Holy Day today, 
this luxury of waking late with my old dog at my feet, still ticking at 15, even though pee seems to leak from her now and then in her deep dog dreams, old lady bladder and nearer now than ever to that impossible fence. When she was young, she jumped them all. Now struggling to lift her haunches from the ground, muscles clearly shuddering. She won't cry out in pain today. This day, same as any other, a little fog coming in, a worn collar, the warm nudge of a wet nose insisting on a walk. Nothing too long, nothing extravagant, just the same route we've taken for years now except the snow melted last night. The thermometer rose past 30, and this morning we are able to go a little bit further. Um, that's a nice poem to read in Rochester when the temperature hit almost 80 degrees today. It always reminds me of when I took walks with Jinx. Um, the next one I'm going to read is called January Elegy. Um, this is the second poem in the second section of the book when we had to put her down. Before my best girl died, I held vigil in the great room. I lay on the floor to hear her animal breath. Organs failing. I was waiting for the arrival of the vet. I was waiting for the arrival of the shot that healed her to sleep. All my life, this waiting for. Death, they say, leaves the door wide open. Now, this month swings on its hinges. In or out, can I hesitate in the frame? I find no comfortable pattern except this one. Listen to January thrum like a drum with two faces, like a rhythm galloping into rain. From here, the field is vast, open, indecipherable. From here, we can draw any conclusion. We can run till we decide we can run no longer. We can curl into the memory that holds our love in its name, straddle any choice like a god changing her mind. Between going forward or looking back, I will always choose to miss you. It's a given how the wings of grace arrive, how their leaving allows this monument to the moment inside, this expansion of the heart possible as the new year, here and as hollow. Um, I'm going to finish up reading two more poems from this book and then I will read um, two newer ones. Um, so this next one is called Sturgeon Moon. I once made love in the green corn, ice and glass. The tassels looked clear as that and phosphorescent. My back in the middle of an empty field rubbed dry on August leaves, leaving imprints on my flesh like scales. Sturgeon have none, no scales that is, but sex. They spawn at 20 near Lake Champlain, spindle-bodied and sultry in the estuaries. From New England to Lake Superior, the blood red moon. I too, familiar with the widening sky, gaped into a morphology of fragmentation. Riverbed, stream, Cassiopeia, branch of tree, once on a rock robed in light in the desolate Adirondacks, I siphoned a Methuselah, grew sleepy. Mornings, I gather what I can, unhook the curved lure from my lip, 
walk into another season smoldering. Um, the last poem I'm going to read from this book um, is called Alexa Plays Miles Davis and my little Amazon Alexa AI often shows up a lot in this book. Alexa plays Miles Davis as I stand over the kitchen island, snapping wooden ends from asparagus, smashing garlic into a fine paste. As the sax crescendos, water rolls to a boil, and this is my day, my half glass of Cabernet working its magic in my veins shrill note of a job de-escalating, transitioning into evenings, I take off professional trappings and let myself go loose to lose myself in music I don't know anything about, except instrumental jazz is something I like, a privilege to enjoy this notion of liking without knowing, because I can't tell you why this balancing act of chaos and clarity, confusion and clear delineation moves me, or why I am allowed to pamper myself in simple pleasures while the world loses itself in a kind of blue that keeps me paralyzed. Stuttering, Alexa skips to a different song, as though intentions are never enough, as if a request is more prayer than action, as a new age tune echoes a drumbeat, begins a synthesized sonorous vocal track, a button pushed in a studio replicating what used to be real. Who is to say what makes anything authentic? What simulacrum does not intuit the shadow's true shape beyond the cave? I am in my kitchen, and in Southeast Asia, the same sun shines as someone flees from genocide. Someone thinks only survival as I waste vegetable scraps. Play act at wonder, as the world's music barrels in, and animal voices in their anguish keep me singing. Um, so I'm just going to read two more um, newer poems. They're not in the book, um, but I like them because they're newer. Um, yeah. So this first one is called Theoretical Frameworks of Intelligence. And I am a high school teacher, so there's SAT and AP exam references in here. <laughs> Wallace Stevens said one must have a mind of winter to regard the frost and boughs, and this is one type of intelligence. To one one's own self to the wondrous tundra, the stark tree, to be the beacon in an empty pasture. Lately, my students come to class brimming with complaints about upcoming SATs, APs, in these, they believe and don't. Kind of the way I believe in the numinous light and close the curtains on the dogmatic. I nod my head, my skull heavy as a briefcase encasing the weight of my brain because though both teacher and student made some solemn pact to weather the storm of prose and poetry, the flood of rhetoric and syntax, the stoic squall of the semicolon, we also know there is a kind of intelligence that cannot be codified. It's been years since I've sat on the other side of a desk, scribbling a zephyr of notes in my intro to psych binder on the triarchic theories of intelligence. Now, even the memory seems wrong. Now, I only want to gather my class around me, take them into the open field of possibility. Listen to the last lines of this poem when Stevens writes of the nothing that is not there and the nothing that is, look at the sky opening, that widening rubric, instructional loop of opportunity. Study with intent, I want to say, 
with insight and sophistication, the way the horizon beckons our vision and then fades. Pass or fail, it's up to you. No multiple choice here, no grades. Um, thank you again, um, everybody, for taking time out of your day to be here and listen to us. Um, and thank you, Dan and David. This is my last poem. Um, miracles and wonder. Each morning's mission, the body's slow rise, the supersized heart, the built-in cabinetry of the brain, the storage drawer for the word petrichor, the smell of earth after it rains, the resilience of the succulent when there is none, the drive to go at all when for days the news is the nation is buckling. The chanting and the songs, the resistance and counter calls, even the bombs, the way they disperse smoke on the street, dissipate into the evening air, become memory. I have no remedy for living. I only want to march into each waking day as inventory commander site supervisor here to witness the astonishing, to log only the miracle, the accumulating proof into a long list of verifiable evidence. See, I'll say, when I encounter disbelief, according to this immersive document, the wonder is that we exist. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Oh, my timer just went off. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so good. <laughs> uh, our next poet is David Ruckberg. David Ruckberg has published two books of poetry, Where is the River Called Pishon and Hour of the Green Light. His poems have appeared in Barrow Street, Cimarron Review, DMQ, Mudfish, Northwest Review, and elsewhere. He was awarded a residency at Gentel Arts in Sheridan, Wyoming, and today is also his birthday, so be sure to wish him a happy birthday. Uh, David, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Dan, and thanks to everybody for, for coming. Uh, as Alicia said, taking time out from your busy days, I really appreciate it. And thanks to Alicia for agreeing to read with me. We both have uh, our books coming out from Future, Future Cycle Press um, by coincidence. Um, Though it's not a coincidence that she and I are both in a writing group together with uh, Charlie and Danielle Cote, and that's really a source of um, uh, pleasure and, and help for us. And uh, thanks to Writers and Books for hosting us. And um, you know, our books can be found at Ampersand, their bookstore, uh, as well as elsewhere. Um, and thanks to my wife Leah for tolerating me being holed up in my studies so often. Um, wordsmithing and fixing commas and stuff like that. So I'm gonna read uh, a few poems from, from this book and then uh, two or three from what I'm working on as well. Um, Hour of the Green Light is, is about, uh, it starts with a poem about being in the great ocean of being and, and choosing to, uh, to be born to enter this life and then the consequences of that decision. The first poem is Delivery. Swimming away from the green horizon, I foresaw a hot light and desiccation, sweetened by a swirl of apricot and apple that would soon enough sour. Birds stirred, fluttered my belly. Sensing life, I gave way to gravity. The amber world heaved in a way that was terrible and fun. I was too new to understand paradox, the cascade of sand, the seasick fish. Some tremendous force of love pressed down on my sun-shaped face. I came to know what the amputee knows, leaving behind my perfect self forever. What I didn't expect was the havoc, 
the calipers tipped with fire. The rigid God who hung me in air and aborted sacrifice. The new world closed its rubber hand around me like a tourniquet, dandling me, inverted and rolling before the crowd, its roar rasping my brand new skin. Um, I guess from, from that experience comes a, uh, an experience of, of wanting. Uh, this poem is called Want. All I've ever wanted is to want. I open my mouth and instead of answers, want comes out. I want more electricity and more capital. I want the clay and imagery of my life to stand up and dance with me, mirroring my movements one for one. That would be answer enough. Instead, what I get is half made men and women going about their business of wanting to. I half dance for them in turn. We form a cockeyed web turning about an imagined center. It's here, it's here, no, over here. If someone could trace its manic path, they might think they discovered a kind of map and understanding. Like the fireflies curlicues, spelling out something other than tireless ache. Uh, documentary and um, uh, this this poem comes from a visit to the uh, Museum of Natural History in, in New York where you get to see really old things and also from a, a report I heard about um, scientists digging a hole deep in the earth to try to uh, record silence. Documentary. That was the year El Nino made us doubt if winter would come at all, but winter would come. That was the century we took note of how long dinosaurs roamed and how long the blink of an eye really was. Blink. Down in the trenches, we fought about usage versus syntax, about how far the neighborhood of love really extended, about the proper arrangement of furniture and voting districts and other bulwarks against the sureties of cancer and angina. Meanwhile, over our heads, clouds raced and birds flew confused along the old flyways. Meanwhile, under our feet, continents floated and crashed. High tides loaded with VOCs threatened the big towns and we continued the old dance to which we gave different names, still hiding from knowing quite why. Down in the deepest hole we ever made, we sought silence and an answer. The data always corrupted by our longing. We threw our arms wide to the universe, aching for embrace. Angry, alone, and afraid, we uncorked another bottle against the steel of a vessel loaded with warheads we named after our mothers. Um, I like to ask questions. My first book begins with questions and, and asks a bunch of them. So uh, this is about that problem, the questions. Come to think of it, I like the questions better than the answers. A question brings an opening as after a week of cloudy days, a patch of blue fresh in the east. Why does one squirrel chase another in arabesques around the hostas and yellow cypress? Is it a territorial dispute? A courtship contest? Maybe they're just playing. Why arabesques? How do the chipmunks know winter is coming, scurrying here and there, their cheeks puffed like Santa's great bag? How do they remember where they hid their cash when day after day they return to the rat traps set for them, licking off the peanut butter and foiling the hammer most days but one? Where do their souls go after I drop their pretty bodies onto the leaf pile? Do they even have souls? Do we? Some questions open out like that, hazy and distant, but all the same unshakable, the kind that give rise to religion and government and all that hegemony. What is a man? What is the proper role of a husband, of a wife? 
when is the best time to fish or cut bait? Leaning back in a green plastic lawn chair in the hazy August night, waiting for the remnants of comets to trace a sky already glowing with the amber of streetlight pollution. These are the things I wonder. The mind wants to clamp down and give answers. It's not that I deny science. The best science, you know, only offers answers that beget bigger questions. If the universe is expanding, what's it expanding into? If God is dead, to what do we keep praying? If the law of tooth and claw is how we got here, why do we love surrender just a little more than good sex? Even the easy questions have uncertain answers. What time will you be home? What should I have gotten you on the 25th annular return of our first and final betrothal? Do I really remind you of your father? Yes or no answers are worst in the way because under each syllable lies a story that might never be told. And meanwhile, off we go in our wobbly separate orbits, approaching perihelion, but still missing the most important messages blown aside by the breezes of our passing. What do you see when you look in the greens of my eyes? How have we come all this way and still remain strangers? Maybe I can help you with that. Maybe you could hold this for me. And um, maybe as an answer to the questions in that poem, uh, this poem, May resolution. What if instead of this slow dying, we took one step more than improve our diets and other resolutions? Rearranged the furniture or replaced it entirely. The books and old clothes, broken tools and picture frames too. Built a fire in the backyard and piled it high with these and other shadowed doubts. Now at the new sofa we sit on, though we might have chosen a darker color, or a lighter one becomes an absolute, a cradle of unending promise. Where the old carpet lay like a field of cinnamon and nails, now gleams the glassy surface of still waters we delight to walk on. Bare feet only, please. Anything else brings a sinking. Instead of books, we read the world and its many pages, turning like pear from linen to green to bare and back again. We delight to take three steps forward and two back, freeing in the dance the old darkness, stale like morning breath, sashaying in the momentary awakening before the next darkness, like slicing into a fat lemon, the hour suddenly burning with scent, the only light we can know. And, um, this, this poem is called, When God Visits Me. When God visits me, he appears at first as a smell of citrus in my wife's hair. And the next morning, as a certain oppressive yet beautiful humidity after the 3 a.m. thunderstorm. The day after that, I'm lying on the couch when he emerges from my belly button, reminding me of the old days when I swam in the green light beneath my mother's navel and anticipated life like a birthday, instead of a sentence that grows more predictable as it nears its conclusion. God waves all that aside with a gesture of layered clouds viewed from a hammock at 8 p.m. on a night in June. There, there, he coos, his hand as his hand moves in slow circles over that particular place on my back that lets me know I am loved. And the last poem I'll read from uh, this book is called Diaphragm. Um, I, I think it's a poem about how to meditate. The house finch sipping at the bird bath darts a look at me, then at the water saying, just breathe. Flits off a blur of russet not intended for my interpretation. A squirrel on the spruce branch works the husk of a black walnut his belly and spine ringing winter, though August isn't finished yet. Just breathe, the backyard says again in silent bells, unaware of anything like tragedy. A sparrow takes a turn at the water, 
The squirrel, nearly finished gnawing, cascades through a cedar shrub, hurrying to bury his cache until another comes to spy, as if either will remember come January. And here I am, reporting it all from my back porch, diaphragm weary from restraint. Memory nags, an incessant mosquito at one ear, while the future remonstrates, alternately wagging and curling one long finger. When I finally step aside and let this body be what it is, noticing the pool of time empties, fills. Traffic on the highway swells, diminishes. The red bud prepares its pods. A breeze lifts the spruce boughs. Okay, that's enough for that one. I'm gonna read two or three uh, from a new project I'm working on. Uh, it's a book called Weather Report. It's about uh, inside weather and outside weather. I'm pretty concerned about climate change. Um, but always about um, being a human being. And so it, it, it looks at both of those. Uh, the, the first one I'll read is called Cutting It Down. It's a true story. My neighbor's having tree work done and the grinding is not conducive to my meditation. There are evildoers in Congress that I wanna grind up like that. But reading Hannah Arendt last night, I recalled it's not just the leaders, but also my neighbors that have done terrible things. My neighbor borders her yard with American flags every holiday she can. And before the last election, she hung a black stars and stripes from the porch. The way I read it was evil lives here, but the flag commerce site shows that it honors fallen police. In that way, it's like all art. The more you know, the more you understand. Maybe it was the Trump signs that threw me off. She had sold me her wheelbarrow just after we moved here, only 25 bucks. I was so happy. It was a beautiful tool. She even offered to drive it over, but I didn't mind walking it around the corner. What a great neighbor I had thought. And even now, though the thought has occurred to me, I would never feed her into the chipper. That's not catharsis. And this morning, as I meditate, I notice the tension in my shoulders and even my teeth. It doesn't help to try to figure out where it comes from. The only thing to do is to get back to the breathing, noticing who it is that's doing it, the grinding. And um, uh, so this one is called Last Hour. Since we only had an hour until apocalypse, she told me everything that was most important to her in life. The smell of fresh ground coffee, but not the taste. The smell of fresh baked bread, sliced and dressed with a slightly forbidden beauty of butter and marmalade, bittersweet. She told me about the thing her father said about her thighs when she was 17 and how she wished she'd filled the silence before he died with forgiveness. She brightened with the memory of her grandson on the swing that day last summer, which lifted up all sorrow, even this one. She recalled how the maple blossoms that had fallen yesterday had softened the concrete of the sidewalk. It only took 10 minutes. Then we took hands and held each other's eyes and listened to the winds begin to rip. Okay, one more and then I'll be done. Um, this one's called Bloom, and it was uh, published recently on a site called Bloom, which is for people who uh, have published their first book after they were 40 years old, which uh, category I fell into. And um, speaking of which, um, Saturday at Writers and Books, who's hosting this reading, I'm teaching a, a class, a workshop uh, called Getting Unstuck, which is a problem a lot of young writers have, which I had. And um, so if you fall into that category, uh, check it out, um, get writers and books and, and sign up. Um, Bloom. Put away the tools of winter now, the wide scoops for lifting light but deadly loads, the axes and picks 
for breaking up the stubborn and slick patches of cold that threaten to break us. Turn the ground, bury what's gone crusty and let it sleep in darkness, renewed by what life sifts up from below, sun warming its back. Cut back the old dead life and nurse the new with tender pats and moisture. A little love every day. No flood, no landslide. Remember to rest, to wait. The rose of Sharon's not dead, nor the woody lavender. After months of lifeless brown, you smell the tree's exhalations, greet the shy bud, then the showy flower. Soon the yard's intoxicated with spice of viburnum, cheered by the red bud's magenta that matches the garden shoes you wear while you sweep dead spruce needles, mixing them into soil, preparing the way. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thanks. Uh, now we're going to have a little uh, talk back discussion. Um, if you have a question, um, please submit it through the Q&A or through the chat. Um, we're going to go back and forth with our, our poets interviewing each other. So um, I thought uh, I would start with uh, Alicia. Sure. Um, <laughs> so if anybody doesn't know this, um, it's also David's birthday today. Um, so we can wish Thank David you. a happy birthday, um, which I just find really special considering that one of the main um, concerns of your book is kind of being born into this confusing world. Um, so I guess my first question for you, I mean, we're in a writing group together, but I've never asked you this. Um, where, where did that idea of, of the, the green light as kind of like akin to being born come from? And does it have anything to do with your faith background? There might be two questions there. Yeah, they are. Uh, the first one's easier, um, uh, but it's a little hard to talk about. Uh, it, it, it was kind of a vision that occurred in a retreat where we're, you know, one of those retreats where you're under a lot of physical stress and then you have a, a breakthrough and a vision. Um, and I, I had this really clear vision of swimming in this green ocean of, of being and then, and then choosing to leave it behind uh, to, to be born in, into life of limitation and pain. And um, uh, it, yeah, it really felt like a choice. A, a, you know, as to the second question about faith or maybe, you know, spiritual or religion, religious uh, aspect of that, you know, I've, I've been in different places with that. I, I've, you know, gone from being um, maybe not religious, but, but having a lot of faith in, in other worlds or an afterlife to, to being pretty skeptical of that. So it's, it's, it was strange to have that experience as a skeptic, but, but it was real. So maybe it's a metaphor for just choosing every day to be alive. Or maybe it's a real historical metaphor of, of making that choice in the womb. Um, I'm, I can't make a decision about whether about that. Or maybe it's all of those things at different times, right? Sure, sure. yeah, that's an option. Yeah, thanks for telling that story. That's interesting. Yeah, thanks. Um, and uh, why green? I don't know, it, it, that's what I saw. So I called it that, it worked for me. I um, mean, it's, it's the color of nature. It's... And, the, and the picture, the picture that is on the cover just is perfect for that, that kind of green, like it's like a nebula or something, right? Like it, it looks like a star before it's born or something. Yeah, uh, it was, I had, that was a long process to choose that cover. I had a, a painting by Chagall I wanted to use that sort of represented what I thought the book was about. But um, the, uh, Diane, our publisher said, well, um, good luck trying to get rights to use that. So I did some research and, and the owner said, yeah, you, you could have that for 400 bucks. And it was like, uh, I, I already spent a lot of money on 
trying to get this book published. So, so I'm not going to do that. But um, then I found this one that was uh, on a NASA website. It's it's of the um, uh, Pleiades cluster um, uh, taken with an infrared uh, telescope. Very cool. Um, I, I I guess I have. I'll just if you don't mind, I'll just ask you another question while I'm. Okay, I thought we'd bat it back and forth, but sure, well, let's go with the flow here. Yeah, well, I'll ask, I'll ask you one more question then. Okay. How about that? Um, so this isn't really so much about your, your book per se, but about the questions in your book. Because I, I know I read your first book, which is a question, right? Where, where is the river called Pishan? Um, the title of your first book is a question, and then you ask a lot of questions even in your poems, um, in Hour of the Green Light. So I guess my question to you, I just said question a lot. <laughs> what questions do you have about poems that urge you to keep at them? Um, what is it about poems that keeps you questioning? Um, do they hold any answers for you? You know, what's your, what's your drive there to keep writing? Yeah, it's interesting. Um... Uh, well, so two parts to that. Well, I guess the the main one is that I write poems because I can't help it. That's the way my mind works. I've I've tried to write fiction, and uh, I was early on in, in college discouraged from doing that. Um, uh, uh, and I won't tell you what my professor said, but but um, basically, I realized I was writing twenty page long poems. So I thought I, I'm just going to write poems instead and not take so much time. Um, but uh, one of the teachers in my MFA program, uh, Heather McHugh, captured it nicely. She said that rhetoric, and by that she doesn't mean just um, empty words or trying to convince something of somebody of something, but, but any kind of speech where you're trying to convey something. Um, rhetoric enacts shapes of mind. And, and I think that's what I try to do in my poetry now is to capture the shape of thought and um, one of my early teachers in that program tried to get me away from um, knowing what I was writing about when I started writing about it and, and my endings being too predictable or overdetermined, as he called it. So uh, as, as Robert Frost said, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. So uh, I, I try not to know too much what I'm writing about in a poem. So I'm not trying to come up with an answer and I'm trying to follow the shape of the thought, I guess. Yeah, and follow the questions, right? Yeah, right. Um, all right, is it my turn to ask questions? So sure. much easier. Um, my first one's just a, a more of a practical question. As a, as a retired teacher, I, I know how hard it is to, to balance my writing life with my work life. How, how do you deal with that? Um, for instance, you had to work today and now you're doing a reading. Yeah, yeah. Um, teaching is exhausting. Teaching high school is exhausting. Um, it's mentally exhausting. So there's a lot of there's a lot of days when I get home and I'm just dead tired. But I, I also teach literature and poetry and rhetoric. Um, so in a, in a strange sort of way, it's also kind of like helping my writing life because I am kind of like Im immersed in that a lot. Right. So, so I am thinking about writing and literature a lot, you know, especially in like my senior AP literature class, um, we, you know, we're analyzing why the writer chose this word, or is this an effective ending or what is the effect of this diction? And somewhere in the back of my brain, I, I probably keep all those questions with me kind of swimming around, right? Um, so in that way, I'm really lucky because I, I teach writing and then I go home and I write and it probably helps me become a better writer, honestly. Um, but I think summer's off is wonderful, right? I mean, all the teachers out there know that you need that summer off. Usually I spend July and August trying to write every day. Like I know everybody does the 
National Poetry Month in April and writing a poem a day for April, which I'm actually trying to do this year and it's a struggle. Um, but I usually have my, my own version of that in July. Um, and I, I didn't, I didn't have, what's, what's the word for it? I didn't really have a lot of structure and routine to my writing um, before I went to the Rainier Writing Write, Writers Workshop to get my MFA. And then of course, as you know, during the program, you have to write all, so many poems per month, no matter what, or you're not going to have anything to give the person you're working with. Um, so I think that helped me just get out of my own head and sit down. So now um, I've kind of gotten into this routine where my, my quota is to write four drafts of um, like four drafts a month, no matter what. So, you know, my, my routine and my ritual basically is waking up on a Saturday or Sunday morning and sitting down with my coffee before I do anything and before I'm awake. And I'm like, I'm not leaving my desk until something is here. Um, so I think just getting in that mindset of like, this is, I have to do this because this is the time that I have to do it. And making sure that I do it and kind of being my own boss, right? Making sure that I kind of clock in and put in the time, I think has has really helped too. And also um, being a teacher, knowing when to put work away. And I guess that's for anything, right? Um, you know, like when I get home from work, I shouldn't be working still, right? Like I leave work at work and come home and then I have a life outside of that. So that, that work-life balance thing that everybody talks about, it's very difficult, but it is a work in progress for me. Um, but I think I'm getting better at it. Yeah. So why, do, why do you do it? Why do you like to not just put your feet up and watch TV? <laughs> I, because my brain is like a pinball machine going in a thousand different directions. And sometimes I just need an outlet. Um, so that, that's part of it. And I, I, I think part of it too is like, I think what is, what is the Joan Didion quote? Like I, I write, I'm probably not quoting her directly, but she said, I write to know what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling and how to process the world. So sometimes I don't even know what, I'm really thinking until it kind of appears on the page. And I'm like, huh, I didn't know I was thinking about. So I think that poetry for me actually helps me know myself a little better, right? It's actually, it's, it's, a, it's beneficial for me um, in a lot of ways. It clears out my, my mind, my cluttered mind. Um, and it also helps me understand what I'm thinking. And now, and, and it's also just fun to make something that wasn't there before, right? Um, I can't paint, I can't draw, I can't sing, but I can like create these words on a page and, you know, making, making something is, uh, it brings me satisfaction. You know, I, I feel like I've accomplished something. Um, so there's, there's that too. Yeah, I think, I think that's probably true of most writers. Um, I have I have a bunch more questions here, but Dan, Dan are there questions from the yeah, chat? Yeah, let me jump in and with a, a question from the audience. Um, this one is directed to David, but uh, uh, I'll ask both of you. Um, who might have in influenced your work in a most, most in a transformative way? Um, well, I, I, I'll, I'll just say who influenced my work first uh, in, in high school was Walt Whitman. You know, it just it just captivated me. And for a long time, W.S. Merwin was was I was deeply into him and probably uh, writing a lot like him for a while. And nobody understood what the hell I was writing about because of that, because um, his poems are somewhat opaque, the early poems. But um, the one who most transformed me, I guess, was my last teacher at Warren Wilson, uh, where I got my MFA, who was Tony Hoagland. 
and not just because of his style of writing where where he and I had both had um, Steve Orland as a teacher and and I think one of the most important things Steve taught me was to write like um, I was writing a letter to someone speaking to someone instead of way off in my head or pontificating about something and 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 Tony exemplified that a lot it just sounded like he was having a conversation and and that was really helpful for me to to make my work more real sounding how about you, how about you Alicia uh, whew, I thought you forgot about me for a second <laughs> Dan I was I was relieved <laughs> um that's that's a really hard question to answer I there, there have been poems in my life where, where I have read them and they were transformational, right? Um, and the fact that a poem can transform the way you feel or, or look at the world, it's like a, it's like a sort of magic, right? Um, I think one of, one of the poems that sticks out in my head is uh, Wislawa Zimborska um, has a poem called The Ball, um, translated from the Polish. And I think it, it changed me. It changed, it changed what I thought language could do. Um, so that's one that sticks out. Um, I, I love Whitman too. Um, I'll be the first one to admit I'm probably not as well read um, as I probably should be. Um, there's a lot of contemporary poets that I thoroughly admire. Um, I'm enamored with Ocean Vong. Um, I think that everything he writes is absolutely beautiful. Um, I love Maggie Smith, um, the way she can kind of take experience and make it sound conversational, but also again, like make you look at the world in a way that changes the world, right? So there's that transformational experience again. Um, I've had so many, I've been so lucky to have so many mentors. I don't even want to start listing them right now because I, I'm scared I will, I would leave someone out. But um, I did see Ralph Black in the chat and he was one of them that was really important to me when I was at uh, SUNY Brockport. Um, I think his class in general just really helped kind of hone my love and appreciation for what poems can do. Um, but there's, there's so many. Um, so I kind of take inspiration from a lot of different places. Um, do, do you want to switch back and uh, ask uh, David a question? Yeah, sure. Um, so, well, you kind of already talked about the new project you're working on, but I, I talked about my writing routines a little bit. Um, what about you? Um, if you want to talk a little bit about like, I mean, me, I kind of wake up in the morning and I sit at my desk and I'm like, you know, close my door so my kittens don't get in and and just kind of focus on that blank page for a little while. Um, so I know it looks like you're in your office right now. Like what is your writing routines? How do you have any sort of like rituals that help you kind of get into the space where you can write? Um, I'm in my living room actually, but oh. that's, that's okay. Uh, yeah, I, I have right now. I'm, I'm not so much and I'm not too worried about it. But um, in, in my 30s, when I was teaching, it was really hard for me to have a routine. And then I would have these long expanses of summer when I would just beat myself up for not writing it. It took me several years to 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 make to figure out a routine for for writing, which was that just to write first thing in the morning, um, you know, a cup of coffee and my notebook, because if I didn't do it then, it wasn't going to happen. And and then I try to do that, um, you know, summers almost every day and, and weekends when I was teaching. Um, and and that was it for a long time. Now that I'm retired, I I, uh, I try to meditate every morning, um, but uh, I'm, I'm not too worried about the writing. I, I, I have joined some groups, like uh, there's a group called The Grind, 
where we write a poem every day and send it to people in a small email group, um, like like the, uh, uh, po the poetry project in April. Um, but then I generate so many poems, it's like I, I have trouble sifting through them and finding them. So I, sometimes I I'm okay with not writing, you know, to to give myself some some air. Um, uh, but it's easier to break with a routine than not to have one. Uh, yeah, me. yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I think that, you know, for, for the longest time, I would just write when inspiration struck. And that wasn't the way to go about it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, in that case, I, I wrote my best poems when I was depressed or angry, but <laughs> there are other parts of myself that I wasn't exploring. Yeah. <laughs> So I know you're you're talking about like exploring like climate change and stuff in your new book. Um, I, one of the things that I struggle with in my writing is trying to not be um, what's the word for it um, like pedantic, right? And like how do you how do you go about writing poems about such a strong subject that people have so many um, kind of I ideas about um, without kind of preaching to the choir. That's that's a delicate balance. Is that something that you find difficult or? Yeah, it was hard when I was thinking about taking on that topic. But my first two books, I, I felt like they were just about the inside of my head and my backyard. And I was pretty tired of those subjects. So I thought I need to get out. And, and some people have uh, really difficult lives or, or, or stressful things happen to them. And I've pretty, been pretty lucky to not have any, you know, major traumas in my life. Um, so th those aren't subjects, but, but climate change concerns me more than anything. And that's why I kind of rolled it into like the inside weather and the outside weather, because I'm, I'm always trying to understand the inside of my head and my relationships. And so I thought I would try to roll that together into something about climate and the weather. Um, so it's not very much about climate. It's not preachy and, and maybe nobody would even notice that, that I was attempting that, but um, I just try to blend it with human life. Yeah. I'm, as I know it. I'm excited to read it. I, I like the title, Weather Report. <laughs> right. Well, next time we meet, I'll give you a sample. <laughs> Dan, do you have, have any? Uh, I think we have one time for one more. Do you, you want to ask a question, David, or I can go to the audience? If... Um, yeah, what would be fair to ask? Um, uh, here, here, I'm going to throw you a tough one, uh, Alicia. Um, in your blurb on my book, you you referred to Keats's negative capability of of uh, of not being in. Um, allowing yourself to be in doubts, mysteries, and uncertainties without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Um, how, do you, how do you manage that in your own writing? Um, hmm. Because I think you do. I'm just wondering how you think you do. Um, oh, thank you. I, yeah, I, th I think you do too. And I, I, uh, I, I, I would like I would like to do it better. <laughs> um, I try. I try to have no idea what I'm writing when I'm writing it. it I know that probably doesn't make any sense, but I I write kind of fast. Um, like when I do sit down to write, I I don't kind of spend a lot of time thinking about the the form or the topic or the subject of the poem um i try to kind of tap into part of myself that's not making uh like logical sense and making more of like an emotional sense um sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't but that's what i that's what i attempt to do yeah can I steal that for my class on Saturday for getting unstuck? Sure. 
<laughs> yeah. Right fast. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, it, it's not like automatic writing, but it, it kind of is in that vein, right? Where like you're kind of writing more by sound and music and a so and like um, maybe what seems illogical association, um, which ends up not being as illogically associated as you might have thought. So there's definitely a surprise in it. Yeah. Great, thanks. I think we'll have to cut off there, but um, thank you so much, uh, David, Alicia. This was really wonderful. I'm uh, glad we could talk about uh, poetry and hear some of your new poetry as well. Um, uh, thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, buy the books, ampersand books, the links in the chat, sign up for David's workshop. The link is in the chat as well. Um, this reading and all of our readings, uh, will be on our website. Uh, so you can check that out when it's up eventually. Uh, and I want to say thank you and have a good night. Thank you, Dan and writers and books. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, writers and books. Thank you, everybody. Um, that came, can't see your faces, but I yeah. good. Thanks, fans. <laughs> Thanks, Alicia. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. You too.